You're listening to Artie Tune, a podcast with artists created and produced by Detlef Schlick, a visual artist and ritual designer, living and loving in West Cork, and best known for his essay about the cause and effect of shamanism, art and digital culture. Working in the field of performance, photography, painting, sound, installations, and film he will dive and discover with us and a weekly creative guest into the unknown and exciting deep ocean of the creative mind. This is Detlef Schlich, and today we dive into the unexpected and very interesting ocean of the creative mind together with David Bickley. Well done, <laughs> you got all that out. <laughs> this, time, this, this time I say it right. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm sometimes sort of, I, I don't have my glasses on. and, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Now, David is is musician, filmmaker, and a uh, uh, multimedia artist and a uh, and um, we had last chat, a very interesting chat about his his pastime in 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 England as he grew up there and and school and um, we started as well with projects. Um, we came to the part of um, the moment when uh, he finished his projects with Brian Eno and when he was able to to buy his first. Avid, what was it? Avid ed, uh, edition? No, it was actually it was a Super VHS. Hi, David. For the wall. Hi, hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. It was a hi. Super VHS ed edit suite. That's, yeah, that's that's what, what I. Uh, can can that's you explain that? Bought. Can you explain well, it that was, uh, for listener? VHS. Who every might well some people might. For S VHS, yeah, yeah. So S VHS yeah. was like kind of higher speed and higher spec, and it was wasn't broadcast, but it was it was close to it. And um, I bought a three machine suite, which was really rare in those days. Three machines basically meant you could do mixes between shots, which is really important for me because I was um, I was doing these landscape films. And I wanted to have these slow dissolves. That was my trademark. Still is really in some. All right. Stuff. So so, so you, um, you you needed quite uh, uh, crisp images if it if it if it came well, to, to it slow motion. Actually, it wasn't actually that crisp. No, it wasn't. Doing, you couldn't do slow motion on it, but. Um, Anything that was slow motion was just shot on film at higher speeds, you know, uh, really. So a lot of the, all that stuff I did. So the stuff with Brian Eno, uh, Brian, well, Brian Eno wasn't even there. He was meant to be there at, the, at this con series of concerts in Lanzarote. Uh, basically, his whole Opal Records uh, company were there with all their artists. And he was meant to be there. And I said, great, I'm going to meet Brian Eno for once. And uh, he wasn't there because his wife had a baby, came early, and he couldn't go. But his brother was there, Roger. And I met Hans, Joachim and Rodelius, who I mentioned to you off air, who um, is was in the band Cluster. And we formed a relationship from that. I met uh, Michael Brook and Laraji. In fact, every kind of ambient head who was well-known at the time. Vim Mertens was there. Harold Budd was there. And got great crack, you know. I can't great. imagine that. I mean, Lanzarote is a lovely place, isn't it? For, for ah, yeah. I mean, as soon as I discovered that tequila was only four euros a bottle or four pounds a <laughs> bottle at that time, I was like, oh, oh my god. god! So get how much was here. how much was in your liver? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how much did it weigh? <laughs> anyway, no, that, but that's like we, we, me and Rogelius bonded over a bottle of tequila at a party, and, yeah. uh, and then we ended up working together. We still do work together occasionally yeah so um yeah so that that was why i, I got the suite and, and basically it meant that when I, I moved to dublin and i was able to put myself out as having this suite so i made a lot obviously a lot of music videos yeah uh with it because there were a lot of there was a lot of music but this was the early 90s in dublin there wasn't a lot of money around i mean i didn't meet another english person for like about a year i swear to all God, right honestly to dublin. in, in, a, yeah, in the, the 90s in 1990 and that's that's interesting. How how came that? 
Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, no, it's a totally different city. I mean, it was half in ruins, you know? and the whole country was like mad. You know? It was a completely crazy place. Um, it was brilliant. Brilliant. Sorry, somebody's trying to ring me here. I have to keep getting rid of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was. Um, so that was Dublin, really. And um, I also discovered, because this this um, edit suite had a very primitive computer attached to it, you could save the edits. So you could save all the decisions you'd made. And then I realized that you could make it into what is called, now this is a bit, a bit nerdy and a bit technical, what's called an auto-conform suite, which basically meant you could make uh, programs offline for television. So it meant people yeah. could come to me, they could edit their programs, take a, a, a disc away, the floppy yeah. disk they could yeah. put it in their big edit suite and make the program a broadcast spec very quickly which made it very yeah. cheap for them to do you see so um so i actually got yeah it was it was a good idea in the end it actually g it kept me afloat and you know kept the money coming in and yeah uh, sure. make, making music videos and then um i said i got into kind of what had happened with the with the landscape films that i'd made in england the three films I made, one in Lapland, one in Ireland, and one in uh, the Sahara. So it's that, Sahara. Was the brand, that was the brand Eno stuff, no? No, this was, well, actually Eno was on, his music was on some of it. And that, that is the point. That uh, you know, One film was shot in the Sahara. One film was shot in in uh, the Arctic, in the northern Lapland. And one film was shot in Ireland. They were called Mythological Lands. They were kind of landscape films based on creation myths of those countries. But what happened was they stupidly never licensed the film the music properly and they just uh, hadn't they God. hadn't actually licensed it they, they, no they'd arranged they had the money to do it i mean they just forgot to do it right uh. and the company and what happened is that on the covers they put music by brian eno yeah but it, which was true the music yeah. was by brian eno, but the music had yeah. been taken from discs and put on the film it wasn't like brian eno had made the music for the film All so right. they were selling it under false pretenses and yeah. Peter Gabriel was another one, and yeah. Enya was another one. So I think uh, they had to withdraw the, the 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 videos which had been put out. You know, these three videos because they were for sell through to video shops and stuff. Ah, and then they but then good. they became kind of cold. So you can find them online. The yeah, mythological lands you can see you can certainly see the the they're mentioned in I think in Eno's Wikipedia they're actually mentioned. They mentioned this one. Yeah. And but what happened then is then I ha then had all the 16 mil footage which had been transferred to um, Super VHS tape, yeah. and I had it all and I, and nobody you know it was mine. So I went to RTE and said, "Are you interested in any of this?" And they said, "Actually, we are because you you know all our programs are all different lengths." And at that time there was no worldwide specification for the length of TV programs, so they're all different yeah. lengths, and there are yeah. all these gaps in between the programs, you know. So they had yeah. to fill them. So they needed things called fillers. So I made all these landscape fillers, little short films oh, right. of Irish yeah. landscape set to traditional yeah. music. And okay. they used them as fillers. And that got me into RTE, which was great. Okay. I mean, that, that helps, doesn't it? I mean, but uh, I'm just, the times were different. You could literally walk into RTE and ask to speak to somebody and they would come down the stairs, take you to the canteen and buy you a cup of tea. It, you know, that, that was what it was like then in Ireland and in, but, in RTE in those days yeah but so so you didn't didn't continue very much with music videos i mean for instance for for my life by the, by the ghosts and the oh no i did oh, no sorry. i did i did uh what happened i then said to um because at the time uh there was a program called the beatbox which was a simulcast so the, it was on radio and tv at the same time brilliant idea so it means you could yeah. i mean this is before stereo tvs it meant that you could listen to the music the music videos in stereo on your big hi-fi yeah. but watch it on yeah. tv on your little cheap tv which is everybody had then so um i said it was sponsored by coca-cola so i said to the guy that was in charge of it who also happened to be the guy who's in charge of the fillers eugene yeah. murray i said why don't yeah. so why don't we approach coca-cola and see if they sponsor us to make a kind of a video band video competition and he said good idea so we did and they gave us some money it wasn't a lot of money in those days but it was enough and um we, we came up with this idea of, of them basically inviting bands to send in uh, recordings of, you know, uh, ideas of, of songs that like videos made for. Yeah, we then yeah. got together. Ian Dempsey was on the panel and we, people like that, and we selected the videos and we selected 32, one from every county. And then me yeah. and my mate, 
cameraman Endro Looney, still my cameraman, went round yeah. the entire country, 32 counties, and shot 32 music videos. So, right. uh, so yeah, that was great fun because I got to go to every county. I had a drink in yeah. every county. <laughs> I mean that's that sounds that sounds like the right way to to uh to spend spend some lifetime with work and and fun at the same time you know and I think you 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 were lucky that 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 you you were probably in your 20s at, to the right time at at the right place Thirst, in my 30s <laughs> Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. No, I mean, before that, as, as you oh, made your right. first yeah, film. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So that, I mean, that's, that's helped probably already a lot, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, and then, okay, then there you were in your 30s. I mean, which, 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 which is good. So you still, you could continue with your... With, with your filmmaking, that's great. That's yeah, well, I did. Well, then, no, what happened? So then I then formed a band in in Dublin called Hyperborea. What happened? I'd always had this interest in in kind of I, well, the Irish language. I love hearing the Irish language sung. Can you, sp can you speak it? No. No? No. It's more Lamfege uh Goira. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that. Is. I mean, Tormizels egum cot. That means the cat oh. has measles. Ah, oh, it's not too bad, man. No, I can't speak it. But I picked up a few <laughs> words, obviously through through mi mixing it. Yeah. So I was always interested in the Irish language, and I was always always. You see, I I remember going to a trad session when I first came to Ireland, and it was in this hotel in Dingle. And it said, there was a notice on the wall, said, trad session tonight, everybody welcome. So I went downstairs okay. with my little hand drum, you know, <laughs> and this is like in the uh, early night. It wasn't uh, even the night, I think this is, this is before I actually yeah. moved to Ireland. So it was like in, yeah. when I came over in like the late 80s or something. Yeah. And I, I joined him with my little hand drum and everyone went, shh. You know, <laughs> and even the Baron player, they were going, shh. I know, you know I, mean? I know. And I was going, <laughs> hello. Yeah. This is not, this is not trad music. To me, you see, I could hear yeah. this tribal thump in trad music yeah, yeah so i that, thought right see, yeah, yeah, just because i was yeah. so annoyed i'm going to put it back in so i formed a band called hyperborea with the <laughs> I idea of putting the thump back into trad music and i was just happened to be at a gig of a friend of mine in dublin and the same a, the same happened to me yeah this, yeah <laughs> yeah i was on, on a trad session as i came 2008 to body the up and uh okay trad sessions so i was alone you know so i was playing with with with, with spoons but yeah. in every hand, two spoons, and I, I was I was playing like the drummer from Led Zeppelin to the trad sessions, you know, yeah. <laughs> singing yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. I mean, with my, yeah. hey, yeah, we'll go to work, yeah. gonna do, gonna buy the fucking bottle, gonna roll, <laughs> roll so you know, more, more like the like the popes as anything else, you know. And I was already uh, I created so much enemies in the first month when I was there on these trad sessions. <laughs> they were looking and they were. I, I know exactly i can exactly imagine how, how how it was for them as you came on with your, with your little drum over there you know so same exactly the same so anyway yeah. i was at this i was at this gig and and the, the support band had this singer and she just had a great voice and she looked amazing it was a great presence and i went out to yeah. and i said you don't sing irish by you guys sing in irish by yeah. any chance she said i'm actually a gwail gore and that yeah she, she was like brought up I, I'm, speaking a, I'm, irish. I'm a what Gwail a... which means she was brought up speaking Irish. So I was went, okay, fantastic. So then I, I'd, I'd uh, been shooting all these videos, as I said, in 32 counties. And one of the studios we'd been to, uh, the man was the, who owned this studio to shoot this band in. He was their manager who owned this nice little studio in Carlo called Nine Stone Studios. And I said, to, he said, would you make a, would you make us another video, you know, get another cut of, or something for the we can use? I said, all right, I'll tell you what, if we do that for you, will you let me have this studio for a weekend? And he said, yeah, okay. So I had yeah. a free studio and in Bagnall's town it was, and we uh, got, I got all these people together. So there was actually Ian yeah. Mayock, who's a whistle player, quite, quite well known. And what's Cormac, his name? Ema Mayock. Uh, I, I, and um, there I was John, Cormac, Ma John Mayock. But... No. And there was uh, uh, Cormac Brennock, who's a uh, whistle player. Um, and yeah. but his, no, his i think it was his brother actually played bazooki 
came down and all these different people I got together I'd met you know through making the videos and we we took um I got my friend Tom Green so Tom Green uh kind of associated with the orb you know the band the orb and was a producer in London and still is an amazing musician we'd worked together on some of the film stuff in London and been doing bits and pieces so I sent him over some a clan ad track, Doolaman, and said, will you sample this up and get some backing drums for me? So we did, yeah. and he produced all these, these little loops and stuff, hundreds of loops, and we brought them down, and we recorded this track called Doolaman. And just, that was it, just one track, and we did a kind of remix of it, and three, three remixes of it, yeah. and we put it out on cassettes, right? And, um, and I, that was it, really. I obviously died, like everything else, and I... I sent it to a record company at the time and apparently this is the story that he he got it and he just put it in his car he hadn't even listened to it and he gave yeah. a lift to this guy who was a publisher and um the, the, this record label was like a kind of trad label but doing interesting trad and your man got yeah. in the car and he was looking through your man's cassette said what's this because it had an interesting cover and he said i don't know stick it on he stuck it on he said you should sign them and uh -huh. he said, all right, I will. And so he did. He signed us. And <laughs> yeah. we did um, we had a little record deal for... Uh, we did basically three records with him. Or two records, I think. And, um, yeah, so it was Hyperborea was... Um, and we did a load of... We, then we wrote... All, we, we, we took... In the, I think the first time we took all traditional tunes and just basically rearranged them, you know, and, and did them in completely different ways. But <clears throat> we got this kind of, like, Indian kind of thing going. So, All right. you know, because at it the sounds, same time, I have to listen to it. I mean, uh, uh, it sounds. Yeah, sounds you'll find loads of it online. Um, yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it was it was a great great band, and and it did it won a Hot Press Award in 1998. The band as for best dance act. So uh, that was it. Then we kind of stopped after that. I think we did one more album, and just recently. So you I, so you toured as well. Well. You know, it was never really successful in the sense I never made any money. I lost money. It cost me a fortune, that band. But um, yeah. but we, I mean, critically, it was critically acclaimed. And we did do, we did kind of tour a bit. We played, we played some quite prestigious gigs. We played, we played the South That's... Bank BBC Live, one of the first BBC Lives. And we yeah. were supported by Jar Wobble, which I thought was rather cool. Ah. <laughs> and uh, we were headline, headlining act, but it was a terrible gig. And then um, was it? We also we also did another gig in Rath Khan, which is with Gwailtact up above Dublin, and we got uh, we were supported by Clanad. Well, most of Clanad <laughs> at the time, you know. So that was great too. I mean, just working with all these people and yeah, great fun. Yeah, but, but, um, it, it, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, people think always oh, okay. So if if they're critically acclaimed, so, so they they must make money. But it's often most yeah. of the case. It is just it's just just for the for the for the for the uh, for the sake of um, getting a good critic. But making really money with music is so difficult. I mean, getting yeah. thousand listeners or. Uh, uh, Paying, I mean, nowadays as well for, for paying, getting, buying your CD. So, like I say, I mean, I met I met Damo Suzuki two years in 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 Cork, and he was standing uh, behind the counter, was selling his own CDs. You know, so <laughs> I know. It's, well, there's Rodelius. So, so Rodelius, who I work with, who was a member of Cluster, was a mem was a member of Cluster because the other Mob Mobius is dead now. But uh, they were a uh, really, really well-known band, you know, and he is so well connected. I mean, he and one of their albums, Eno, did Eno and Cluster, you know, so like really well yeah. connected. But he still had to have a, a kind of a grant or a, not even a grant, but a kind of a, a helping hand from his local town just to stay alive. You know what I mean? So yeah, people, yeah, just because people are well known and they're really famous uh, or they're doing seem to be doing well, doesn't mean they're actually making any money. Uh, well, and especially in this day and age, you know, it's really difficult, you know. Uh, I mean, the only he, way to, with the, the whole digital realm in music, the only way to make money was effectively uh, doing live gigs. And now that's stopped. It's really bad for musicians. I know, I mean, uh, uh, I'm still in contact with friends of mine from Cologne. Uh, a friend of mine, she's a singer in a, in, a, in a Queen cover band. And in Normandy they have their... 100 gigs every year still or maybe maybe more 
uh, and nothing happens now, you know, and and they really, I mean, apart from 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 the fact that they don't earn money, it's, it's as well a, a couple of the musicians already committed suicide. You know, I mean, not of this band, but friends of her you know see see no future yeah well it's gonna yeah. it kind of get go that way really i mean and it's always been going that way but this it's because it's a corporate industry you know what i mean i mean really i mean doing on a, on a low key when when you could do gigs and you could sell your own cds you were making more money than you were out of your record deals yeah if you were a small band yeah but unfortunately yeah that's all gone by the wayside now yeah 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 i don't know i mean we, we still live in interesting times somehow so it's a well you've got to keep making music i mean but in many ways maybe that's what happens because because there is no future there's no hope and there's you know what i mean there's no chance of any record there's no chance of making any money because everybody's just robbing your music offline that's when you get more creative you think well there's nothing left apart from to be true to myself you know and i mean the, the this actual lockdown has been I've noticed a lot of people have changed direction. Yeah. And uh, I remember writing yeah. something down, or maybe I read it years ago, that before you change direction, you have to stop. Yeah. Which is very true, because if you, you know, every, it, was, it was Barbara Hepworth, the, uh, the sculptor the, from, yeah. who lived in Cornwall, yeah. who wrote that if every artist could pull the thread, and it's not quite accurate, this, but there's something like this. If every artist could pull the thread they're born with to its very end they would create a new style and yeah. effectively you know that is true that if every artist just does what they're meant to do what they were born to do then yeah. well, the world would be full of incredible art and music you know but we don't we try and do things which we think the arts council will like so we can get a grant you know which is yeah I'm it's not <laughs> It's not the right way to approach it, you know. So yeah, uh, I mean, the lockdown, yeah. people have stopped. Yeah, but, uh, but this path, you know, we veer off. So we veer off the path. It's not like we take a, a quick turn. We, we're, we're led off the path by you know, the yearnings for making a few quid. And we're way off the path. But in order to get back on our path, you know, it's either a very long journey back or you stop and then yeah. make that journey back so that i think the, the 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 lockdown has allowed artists to stop you know suddenly in panic initially but then in kind True. of in kind of reverie to their own talent and then and then they do something different so i i basically uh, sold yeah. all of my equipment and, re and bought other equipment to change okay. physically change my direction in in all music right. Yeah. All right. I mean, it is actually the same in my case, you know, I mean, so I was working on my opera and I couldn't couldn't work further on that. So I had to, th to rethink my situation as well. What what can you do? That's the reason why I start with my podcast, there just getting in, just getting in again, a new technology that's already so a jump to the third part, just getting in into into new technology. As I will speak in the third part about that as well. Um, and uh, I would say this is a good chance to stop it here now in the second part because we're already 25 minutes are over more. I mean, time flies. It no, is it weird. Mean, when you're having fun. It is, isn't it? All right. So well, it's, uh, I'll it's, see you, see it you is, on the flip, flip side. It is, it is great, David. Really, it's so interesting. And, and I really, 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 I'm really happy to have you here. You know, so. I'm delighted uh, to chat. Th thank you, you very much. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Did, Dear listeners, tune in if you if you want to to hear more about our chat uh, about Davis' experience and as well uh, about how what can we artists do in in, in the twenty first century? So how can we use uh, our digital revolution in order to keep ourselves uh, still happy? You know. All right, uh, David. Thank you. See you soon. Right. Take care. Bye. 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 This is a listener-supported show. I feel honored if you subscribe to this show. You can follow me non-financial with the following click on one of my Instagram accounts or subscribe the visual version of this podcast on YouTube via the link below. If you like what you hear, be sure to tune in this Sunday for the third part of this Attitude Audio Triptych. If you want to leave a donation for a coffee or a bus ticket, just follow the donation link via the Attitude Podcast account. Eventually, I would like to thank 
through this medium all my members and listeners of the I Love West Cork Artists Network from all over the world. Just to remember myself that without you, this year couldn't and wouldn't happen. You have listened to Artitude, West Cork's first art, fashion and design podcast. Artitude, never so close again. Ah! That was too close.